Well, hey everybody, research here again. We're gonna take a little intermission this time. Uh, this History Channel Civil War game is not very long, so we're gonna pad things out a little bit with some of the other video games that focus on the American Civil War. Uh, and it's going to give us a chance to kind of go into depth on, uh, on certain things. Uh, this time, I'm going to talk about naval architecture, the ironclads of the American Civil War. And I'm going to talk for a while, so if this is not something that you're interested in, uh, you don't have to watch this one. This game is called Ironclads American Civil War. Uh, it's from a Russian uh, publisher, no, team called Totem Games. Uh, it came out in 2009. I uh, have a uh, U.S. campaign and a C.S. campaign, uh, and it focuses on this sort of alternate history where Great Britain, France, and Spain are interfering in the Civil War. Uh, so let's take a look at the C.S. campaign here. The Confederation does not have enough factories, and their funding of the war against the North comes from cotton and tobacco trade with Europe. Okay, the, that's Confederacy, not Confederation. Uh, if the U.S. fleet is allowed to establish a blockade of the Confederation's shipping routes. They would be effectively hamper trading between the South and Europe. England and France have threatened the USA with an attack to distract the enemy fleet. This should give us the, in chance, uh, give us the chance to improve our Navy, to protect our shipping lanes, and continue our trades. We do not have seamen, we do not have weapons, and we do not have any ships. But we do have courage and honor, exclamation mark. Well, let's give it a shot. So the first level here focuses on the meeting of the ironclads, the, uh, the very, very famous uh, Battle of Hampton Roads, which I'm gonna get into. But first, we're gonna take a look at this game. Beautiful, isn't it? So there's the Virginia, CSS Virginia, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a little bit. This is a turn-based naval combat game. I have seen turn-based combat done very well in some games. This is regrettably not one of them. It's got a little bit of a clunky interface. There's no tutorial, but uh, but it's it's not terribly complicated. It's just a matter of sailing close to the enemy, uh, typing in your your moves. Here you can change your uh, your your rudder angle, uh, your speed. You hit move. You go. Uh, you use up all your movement points, and if possible, you fire your guns. Uh, and once you have done this on all your ships, you end your turn, and the enemy does uh, does their turn. So these three ships, these little gunboats here, uh, are grouped together. Uh, so they're all going to stay together until I separate them. The uh, CSS Teaser uh, was a real ship. Well, I suppose all three of these guys, the Jamestown and the Raleigh, were all real ships. But, um, but they would not have been appropriate for this type of attack. Uh, so... I have four ships. The enemy has three ships. Here's Hampton Roads. There's Newport News off there to the, le to the uh, left, the James River to the left. And then um, uh, if you are familiar with the Battle of Hampton Roads, this is, uh, this is a very fun map to look at because this battle was fought over two days all over this place. Uh, so in this little uh, strategic map, you can... Click on your individual ships. You can see their stats. Unfortunately, uh, most of this is in metric, and uh, and that's a little strange for a Civil War game. So it's a little challenging to figure out what the hell guns they think these ships have, uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter, uh, as you will soon see. So there's the monitor, the uh, the enemy ship, the cheese box on a raft, they called it, the pillbox on a shingle. It was a very strange ship for that time. And then they have a couple of uh, gunboats uh, coming along as well. So we can just check these guys out, see what kind of armament they have, see what sort of uh, speed and maneuverability they have. But though, again, that's going to play almost no role here at all, as you will soon see. Uh, so get used to this. You're going to be looking at this for a little while. I'm really not going to get too much into this game. This is uh, this is not 
a very deep game and it's a very slow paced game but what it's attempting to do is give you an idea of ironclad combat uh decently realistic ironclad combat unfortunately realistic ironclad combat mostly means ships sailing around and firing at each other with little to no effect which doesn't make for very engaging gameplay does it so what i'm gonna do is tell you about the battle of hampton roads so Let's back up a little bit. The Battle of Hampton Roads is generally referred to as either the Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack or the Battle of the Ironclads. Now, the two ships, the Monitor on the Union side and the Merrimack on the Confederate side, uh, it, the jury's still out on whether the ship should be called the Merrimack or the Virginia. The Merrimack was the Union ship, the USS Merrimack, uh, but it was abandoned and burned to its waterline when, uh, when Confederate forces were moving in. The Confederates captured it and rebuilt it into an ironclad and called it the CSS Virginia. Uh, but Monitor and Merrimack kind of rolls off the tongue there, doesn't it? So people do tend to prefer that. Uh, so, the Battle of the Ironclads was a very, very important event in naval history. Uh, it is arguably the most important naval battle of the American Civil War, uh, at least from the standpoint of the development of navies. It was fought over two days, March 8th and March 9th, 1862, in Hampton Roads, an area in Virginia where the Elizabeth and the Nansamond Rivers meet the James River, uh, right where it's entering Chesapeake Bay. Uh, now the city of Norfolk is right in that area. Uh, this battle was part of the effort of the Confederacy to break the Union blockade, which was cutting off Virginia's largest cities, uh, Norfolk and Richmond, from international trade. Uh, the South depended greatly on European trade, and so a blockade was particularly effective against them. The major significance of the battle is that it was the first meeting in combat of ironclad warships, uh, the, the Monitor and the Virginia. The Confederate fleet consisted of the ironclad ram that was built with a ram, uh, the Virginia, built from the remnants of the USS Merrimack, and several smaller supporting vessels that really didn't do very much during the battle. On the first day of the battle, they were, uh, they were opposed by several regular old wooden-hulled ships in the Union Navy. Now, the Virginia was able to destroy two ships in the flotilla, the USS Congress uh, and the USS Cumberland, and it was going to attack a third, the USS Minnesota, which had run aground. Uh, in fact, all three ships had run aground at some point during the battle, which was a little embarrassing. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, action was halted by darkness and falling tide, so the Virginia retired uh, to go back up the river and take care of her wounded, uh, which included her uh, captain, Frank Buchanan, uh, and to repair her minimal damage. Uh, interesting thing here, the USS Minnesota... Uh, the ship that had run aground was the Mary Max sister ship. So here you had a wooden version and an ironclad version of the same ship battling it out. So how better to compare the effectiveness of those two different ships? Uh, the Cumberland was, uh, was run aground and uh, was given a chance to surrender. Uh, they did not and opened fire. Uh, and Franklin Buchanan, the captain of the Virginia, was so incensed by this uh, that he had hot shot, red hot shot, loaded into the cannon. Uh, he fired that into the uh, into the Congress. Uh, I'm sorry, into the Cumberland. Uh, set it on fire, uh, and was still so insane with rage that he grabbed his own rifle and went up on deck and started firing uh, and unfortunately he was very obviously the captain uh, union sharpshooters shot him in the leg uh, and he was brought below so he was wounded on day one uh, determined to complete the destruction of the minnesota uh, roger jones 
stepped in as captain while Captain Buchanan was try, uh, was getting uh, was getting treated for his leg wound. Uh, Roger Jones returned the ship to the fray the next morning, March nine. However, by an, an just an incredible coincidence, and the the whole series of events leading up to the meeting of the two ironclads was an incredible set of coincidences. During the night, the ironclad, the Union ironclad monitor had arrived and taken a position to defend the Minnesota. The Minnesota was sort of going back and forth on trying to refloat. They were dumping guns overboard. They were doing everything everything they could to lighten the ship to try to back off. And then the monitor arrived, and the monitor was so small and had only two guns uh, that uh, everyone on the Minnesota just sort of gave up hope and, and instead decided to evacuate. Uh, but anyway... Uh, the monitor was there, ready to defend, and the monitor uh, was waiting when the Virginia approached. The Virginia came in to attack the Minnesota. The monitor moved in to intercept. The two ironclads moved into basically knife fighting range and fought for three continuous hours, just circling around, blasting into each other. Uh, neither one able to inflict significant damage on the other. Uh, the duel ended completely indecisively. It was basically a draw. Uh, the Virginia returned back up river to the Gosport Navy Yard for repairs. The Monitor moved back to defend the Minnesota. Uh, the two ships did not end up fighting again, and the blockade remained in place. Uh, but here's the main thing. Even though nothing really happened during the fight, the battle received worldwide attention. It had immediate effects on navies around the world. Navies all across the globe, particularly the preeminent naval powers, Great Britain and France, halted all construction of wooden-hulled ships, and basically all the other navies followed suit. A new type of warship, the Monitor-style warship, was produced based on the principles of the USS Monitor and the use of a small number of very heavy guns, mounted so they could fire in all directions, was first demonstrated by Monitor, but soon became standard in warships of all types. Uh, and then for, uh, for various terrible reasons, uh, the shipbuilders also incorporated rams into the design of warship hulls for the rest of the century. I should mention that uh, the Virginia was a steam ram and used that ram on day one of the battle and sank a ship with it so everyone looked at that example and said hey rams have now been successful in 100 percent of all ironclad battles so let's do that and they were it was it was not good it was not a useful uh, addition but uh, you know nobody really knew that so let's look at this in some more detail. So on April 19th, 1861, shortly after the outbreak of hostilities at Charleston Harbor, that was, uh, was Fort Sumner, uh, President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a blockade of ports in all the seceded states. On April 27th, after Virginia and North Carolina had also passed ordinances of secession, that means they, they joined the, uh, the Confederate states, uh, the blockade was extended to include their ports also. Uh, but even before the extension, uh, local troops seized the Norfolk area and threatened the Gosport Navy Yard in Portsmouth. The commandant there, Ch Captain Charles S. McCauley, uh, was loyal to the Union, uh, but he was immobilized by the advice he received from his subordinate officers, uh, mostly uh, people who were not loyal to the Union. So he had orders from Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells to move all of his ships to northern ports, but he waited, he was indecisive, he didn't act until April 20th, when he finally gave orders to scuttle the ships and destroy the facilities. Uh, nine ships were burned to their water lines, including the screw frigate USS Merrimack. Uh, the uh, old frigate Cumberland was towed away successfully, but the Merrimack burned to the water line and then sank. And what that meant is the engines remained intact. The destruction of the Navy Yard was shockingly ineffective. Uh, you would think it would be pretty easy to destroy a yard full of flammable explosive things, but they did not do a very good job at all. In particular, the large dry dock there was relatively undamaged and was very quickly put back into action by the Confederates. 
And without firing a shot, the advocates of secession had gained for the South its now largest navy yard, as well as the hull and engines of what would very quickly become its most famous warship. They seized more than a thousand heavy guns, gun carriages, and incredibly large quantities of gunpowder. Well done, Captain Charles S. McCauley. So, with Norfolk and its navy yard in Portsmouth, uh, the Confederacy controlled the southern side of Hampton Roads. To prevent Union warships from attacking the yard, the Confederates set up batteries at Sewell's Point and Craney Island, which you would have just seen here on the little uh, two-dimensional strategic map here in this terrible, terrible game. Uh, the Union retained possession of Fort Monroe and, uh, and held on to that for the duration of the war. Uh, they also held small man -made, a small man-made island known as the Rip Raps on the far side of the channel. Uh, it doesn't matter. Fort Monroe and Fort Wool gave the Union, control, uh, the Union forces control of the entrance to Hampton Roads. Uh, the blockade was initiated on April 30th, 1861, and it cut off Norfolk and Richmond from the sea completely. To further the blockade, the Union Navy stationed some of its most powerful warships right there in the harbor. Uh, there they were under the shelter of the shore-based guns at Fort Monroe and the batteries at Hampton and Newport News, and out of the range of the guns at Sewell's Point and Craney Island. So for most of the first year of the war, the Confederacy couldn't really do anything about that. So let's look at the birth of the ironclads. When steam propulsion began to be applied to warships, naval constructors renewed their interest in armor for the vessels. And now, people had experimented with armoring ships before. Uh, in the Crimean War, uh, there were some examples of that. That uh, was 1853 to 1856, just before the American Civil War. Uh, and I apologize if I keep referring to the Civil War as the Civil War and not the American Civil War. I realize that not all of you uh, will jump to assuming that it is the American Civil War. I, I uh, am sorry about that. Uh, and so the British and the French navies had each built armored ships and were planning to build others. Uh, in the 1860s, the French navy built La Gloire, uh, the world's first ocean-going ironclad warship. Uh, Great Britain followed one year later with the HMS Warrior. Uh, the Warrior was such an interesting-looking ship. It looked like an old-timey wooden sailing ship, big ship of the line, some, you know, HMS Victory-looking thing, only just pitch black, just evil-looking iron thing. But the use of armor remained controversial, and they, the ships never really went on to any distinction. Uh, and the U.S. Navy was pretty reluctant to embrace the new technology. The, you know, the middle of a war is not the time to start experimenting with something like that. Uh, so, Civil War broke out in 1861. Uh, Confederate Secretary of the Navy Stephen R. Mallory was an enthusiast for the advantages of armor. As he looked on it, the Confederacy could never match the industrial north in numbers of ships, so they had to compete by building vessels that individually outclassed those of the Union. Very clever idea. Armor, he believed, would be the edge necessary. So, Mallory gathered himself a group of men who could put his vision into practice, among them John M. Brooke, John L. Porter, and William P. Williamson. Mallory's men searched the South for factories that could build engines to drive the heavy, very heavy ships that he wanted, but he found no place to do it immediately. Uh, the best facility uh, right off the bat was the uh, Tredegar Iron Works there in Richmond. Building engines from scratch would take at least a year. That wasn't going to work. Uh, so Williamson suggested taking the engines out of the burned-up Merrimack. Uh, it, had, it had been raised off of the uh, bottom of the river at this point, but nobody really knew what to do with it. His colleagues accepted the suggestion, and they expanded it, proposing uh, their design of their projected ironclad onto that existing hull. Porter produced the revised plans, which were submitted to Mallory for approval. On July 11th, 1861, the new design was accepted, and work began almost immediately. The burned-out hull was towed onto the graving dock that the Union Navy had failed to destroy. That's the big old dry dock there. Well done. 
Uh, during the, subs- uh, the subsequent conversion process, the plans developed further. So they were, they were, they were inventing this thing as they went. They were just kind of making it up uh, along the way. Very, very impressive stuff. Uh, so the plans were developed to incorporate an iron ram. Uh, the remodeled ship's offense, in addition to the ram, consisted of 10 guns, six 9-inch guns, smoothbore Dahlgren guns, uh, two 6.5-inch guns, and two 7-inch Brook rifles. That's right, rifles, rifled cannon. That was a big deal at this time. Uh, trials showed that these rifles firing solid shot could pierce up to eight inches of iron of armor plating, uh, and the Tredegar ironworks could produce both solid shot and shell. Shell in this case being an exploding shell. Uh, and since it was believed that the Virginia would only face wooden ships, she was given only shells. Uh, the armor plating, originally meant to be one inch thick, was replaced by double plates, each two inches thick, backed by 24 inches of iron and pine wood. The idea there was that it would be a, uh, an energy-absorbing cushion. Uh, the armor was pierced for 14 gun ports, four on each broadside, three forward, and three aft. Uh, as you can see on my horrible little uh, CSS uh, Virginia here in the game, uh, I only have... I only seem to have four guns total, or maybe maybe each of these guns represents more guns. Um, I don't know. This is not a very good game. Anyway, the revisions, together with the usual problems associated with the transportation system of the South, resulted in incredible delays that pushed the launch date out until February 3rd, 1862, and she was not commissioned until February 17, uh, bearing the name the CSS Virginia. Now, what about the Monitor? Intelligence came to the Union very quickly that the Confederates were working to develop an ironclad, and this caused a lot of worry for the Navy. Uh, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells waited for Congress to meet to request permission to consider building armored vessels. Congress gave this permission on August 3rd, 1861. Wells appointed a commission, which became known as the Ironclad Board, of three senior naval officers, uh, to choose among the designs that were submitted for consideration. The three men were Captains Joseph Smith, Hiram Paulding, and Commander Charles Henry Davis. The board considered 17 designs and, the fir- and uh, chose to support three of them. Uh, many of these designs have been lost to history, and I would love to see what people who had never heard or seen an ironclad before came up with. Anyway, first of the three to be completed... Uh, even though she was by far the most radical in design, was Swedish engineer and inventor John Ericsson's USS Monitor. Ericsson's Monitor was built at Ericsson's Yard on the East River in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Uh, incorporated new and, st- and uh, striking design features, the most significant of which were her armor, obviously, and armament. Instead of the large numbers of guns and rather small bore that characterized warships of the past, Erickson opted for only two guns of very large caliber. He wanted to use 15-inch guns, but he had to settle for 11-inch Dahlgren guns when the larger size were unavailable. For comparison, 15-inch guns were some of the biggest guns used in World War II. The, um, uh, the Yamato, I think, had 16-inch guns. So, so... <laughs> Erickson was a little ahead of his time here. Anyway, these were mounted in a cylindrical turret. First time anyone had tried that. 20 feet in diameter, 9 feet high, covered with iron, 8 inches thick. The whole thing rotated on a central spindle and was moved by a steam engine that could be controlled by one man. Uh, Erickson was afraid that using the full 30 pounds of black powder to fire the huge cannon uh, would risk... A, uh, an explosion in the turret, uh, so he demanded that the, a charge of only 15 pounds be used, so only half strength uh, powder charge. Uh, as with the Virginia, trials found that a full charge would pierce armor plate, uh, and this finding would certainly have affected the outcome of the battle if they had done it a little bit earlier. Uh, a serious flaw in the design was the pilot house from which the ship would be conned. It was a tiny little pyramid-shaped structure uh, on the main deck, uh, and its 
presence meant that the guns could not fire directly forward. Uh, and it was also isolated from other activities on the ship. Of course, this is earlier, uh, or th this is far too early for shipboard telephones or anything like that. So guys were just running from one end of the ship to the other with messages, and that's not a great way to do things. Uh, anyway, despite the late start and the novelty of the construction, the monitor was actually completed before the Virginia, but the Confederates did get the Virginia out to sea first. So we know where the monitor came from. We know where the Virginia came from. Let's look at the battle. So the battle began when the large and unwieldy CSS Virginia steamed into Hampton Roads on the morning of March 8th, 1862. Captain Buchanan intended to attack as soon as possible. Uh, Virginia was accompanied from her moorings on the Elizabeth River by the Raleigh and the Beaufort. Uh, and if you look over here uh, at the game, one of our ships is the Raleigh. How about that? Uh, and it was joined at Hampton Roads by the James River Squadron, the Patrick Henry, the Jamestown, and the Teaser. Well, how about that? That's all the ships that I have right here. That means uh, two ships are missing, the Beaufort and the Patrick Henry, uh, but that's fine. When they were passing the Union batteries at Newport News, the Patrick Henry was temporarily disabled by a shot in her boiler that killed four of her crew. Uh, at this time, the Union Navy had five warships at Hampton Roads, in addition to several support vessels. The Sloop of War, USS Cumberland, the Frigate Congress, uh, were anchored in the channel near Newport News. The Frigate St. Lawrence and the Steam Frigates Roanoke and Minnesota. Uh, steam Frigates, remember, the Merrimack was a steam frigate. Uh, they were parked near Fort Monroe, along with the store ship USS Brandywine. Uh, the latter three got underway as soon as they saw the Virginia approaching, but soon they all managed to run aground on a sandbar. Good job. Uh, St. Louis and Roanoke took no further important part in the battle. Uh, Virginia headed directly for the Union squadron. The battle opened when the Union tug Zouave fired on the advancing em enemy and the Beaufort replied. Uh, this preliminary skirmishing did not have any effect at all. And the Virginia didn't fire until she was within very close range of the Cumberland. Uh, the return fire from the Cumberland and Congress bounced off the iron plates without penetrating, uh, though later some of the Cumberland's payload did do some very light damage. Uh, you know, none of the plates were punctured or anything, but uh, but this was all riveted together, and uh, and when the shots would impact on a rivet, the rivet would break and go f just bouncing around inside the um, inside the gun deck. So I'm sure that was a delight. Can you imagine the sound of that? being hit by however many iron cannonballs while you're in a big iron ship must have been pretty noisy. Anyway, the Virginia rammed the Cumberland below the waterline and she sank rapidly. Uh, here we go. Gallantly fighting her guns as long as they were above water, according to Buchanan. Uh, she took 121 seamen down with her. Uh, and then uh, many of them were wounded but survived, and that brought the casualty total for that ship to 150. Ramming Cumberland nearly resulted in the sinking of the Virginia. The bow ram got stuck, uh, and as the Cumberland began to go down, she nearly pulled the Virginia down with her. Uh, the, uh, the Virginia had rammed into the side of the Cumberland and then fired a cannon right into the side. It knocked a hole seven feet wide under the waterline, so the Cumberland was done for. Uh, luckily, the uh, current caused the two ships to begin twisting, uh, and the uh, ram snapped off, and that, uh, that released the Virginia. So that was a close one. Uh, Buchanan next turned the Virginia on Congress. Uh, seeing what had happened to the Cumberland, Lieutenant Joseph B. Smith, the captain of the Congress, ordered his ship grounded in shallow water. Uh, by this time, the James River Squadron, commanded by John Rudolph Tucker, had arrived and joined the Virginia in the attack on the Congress. After about an hour of unequal combat, the uh, badly damaged Congress surrendered. Uh, while the surviving crewmen of the Congress were being ferried off the ship, a Union battery on the North Shore opened fire on Virginia. Uh, and in retaliation, the furious Buchanan ordered Congress fired upon with hot shot, uh, which is uh, cannonballs put into the boiler to get them up to red hot. Uh, the Congress caught on fire, and it burned for the rest of the day. Uh, at midnight, the flames reached the magazine, and she exploded. 
exploded very spectacularly, they say. Uh, personnel losses included 110 killed or missing and presumed drowned. Another 26 were wounded, uh, several of whom died very shortly after. If you want to read a very dramatic account of this battle, uh, the uh, the author and uh, and amateur treasure hunter slash historian Clive Cussler uh, has written extensively about the battles of uh, of the Civil War and uh, and did a, a wonderful job describing this fight. Uh, so that's the Cumberland and the Congress now down. Uh, now, although she hadn't suffered anything like damage, the uh, damage she'd inflicted, the Virginia was starting to get a little beat up here. Uh, the shots from the Cumberland, the Congress, and the uh, the big cannon on shore had riddled the smokestack, uh, and it was affecting the uh, the oxygen into the engines uh, and reducing her speed. Now, the Virginia was already a very very slow ship, so this is a pretty big problem. Uh, two of her guns were disabled and several armor plates had been loosened, though luckily none had been lost. Uh, two crew were killed and a couple more had been wounded. And one of the wounded was Captain Buchanan, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, had gotten up on uh, on the deck firing his own rifle. Uh, he was so incensed by uh, by being fired on after he'd allowed the Congress to uh, to surrender. So... The James River Squadron had turned its attention to the Minnesota. Uh, the, uh, the, w- the Minnesota, of course, was the one that had run aground. Uh, after the Virginia had dealt with the surrender of the Congress, she joined the James River Squadron despite her damage. Uh, but dis- uh, because of her deep draft and the falling tide, uh, Virginia wasn't able to get close enough to be effective. I mean, if, if three ships that are not covered in thousands of pounds of iron manage to get stuck on shore, you can bet that something as heavy as the Virginia is not going to be able to operate in shallow water. So, uh, Virginia could not get close enough, couldn't be effective, darkness was falling, uh, so the attack was suspended. Virginia left with the expectation of coming down the next day and completing the task. Uh, She retreated to the safety of Confederate-controlled waters off Sewell's Point for the night, had killed 400 enemy sailors, and had only lost two crew members. The Union had lost two ships, and three were now aground. The United States Navy's greatest defeat until World War II had now caused a panic in Washington as Lincoln's cabinet met to discuss the disaster. Uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton told the others that Virginia might attack East Coast cities, might even come up and shell the White House before the meeting ended. He he kept staring out the window like he thought it was just going to come rumbling up Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, But Wells assured his colleagues that they were safe because the ship could not traverse the Potomac River. And he also added the Union had an ironclad of its own and it was heading to meet the Virginia. So let's look at part two of this battle. March 9th, Monitor versus Virginia. So both sides used the respite to prepare for the next day. Virginia put her wounded ashore and underwent temporary repairs. Captain Buchanan, unfortunately, was among the wounded, so command on the second day fell to his XO, Lieutenant Catsby Roger Jones. Jones proved to be no less aggressive than the man he replaced, uh, and while the Virginia was being prepared for the renewal of battle, and while the Congress was still ablaze, Monitor, commanded by Lieutenant John L. Warden, arrived in Hampton Roads. Uh, The Union ironclad had been rushed to Hampton Roads, uh, been dragged by tugs most of the way because it, like the Virginia, was very, very slow. Uh, It had been rushed to Hampton Roads in hopes of protecting the Union fleet and preventing Virginia from threatening Union cities. Now, Captain Warden was informed that his primary task was to protect Minnesota. So Monitor took up position near the ground of Minnesota and waited. Uh, All on board felt that we had a friend that would stand by us in our hour of trial, wrote Captain Gershom Jax von Brunt, the vessel's commander, in his official report the day after the engagement. The next morning at dawn, March 9, 1862, Virginia left her anchorage at Sewell's Point and moved to attack the Minnesota, which was still aground. She was followed by three ships of the James River Squadron, and they soon found their course blocked, however, by the newly arrived Monitor. Now, at first, Jones believed the strange craft, which one Confederate soldier mocked as the cheese box on a raft, uh, to be a boiler being towed from the Minnesota. Didn't even think it was a ship. 
he did not realize the nature of his opponent, but soon it became very apparent that he had no choice but to fight her uh, because the first shot of the, of the engagement was fired at Monitor by the Virginia. The shot flew past the Monitor and struck Virginia. I'm sorry. The shot flew past Monitor and struck the Minnesota, which answered with a broadside. And this began what would be a lengthy engagement. Again, all hands were called to quarters, and when she approached within a mile of us, I opened on her with my stern guns and made a signal to the monitor to attack the enemy, Von Brunt added. After fighting for hours, mostly at close range, neither could overcome the other. The armor of both ships proved adequate. Uh, in part, this was because each was handicapped by her offensive capabilities. Buchanan and the Virginia had not expected to fight another armored vessel, so his guns were supplied only with shell rather than with armor-piercing shot. Shell, again, is an exploding uh, uh, munition, uh, and shot would be a solid cannonball. The monitor's guns were used with a standard service charge of only 15 pounds of powder, uh, which did not give the projectile sufficient momentum to penetrate her opponent's armor. Uh, con tests conducted after the battle showed that the Dahlgren guns could be operated safely and, efficiency and efficiently with charges of as much as 30 pounds. So, oops. Uh, the battle finally ceased when a shell from Virginia struck the pilot house of the monitor and exploded, driving fragments of paint and iron through the viewing slits uh, into Warden's eyes and temporarily blinding him. As no one else could see to command the ship, the monitor was forced to draw off. Uh, the XO took over and the monitor returned to the fight uh, in the period of command confusion. However, the crew of Virginia believed that their opponent had withdrawn. Uh, and although the Minnesota was still aground, the falling tide meant she was out of reach again. Furthermore, the Virginia had suffered quite enough damage to require extensive repair, much more than day one. Uh, and convinced that his ship had won the day, Jones ordered her back to Norfolk. Uh, at about this time, the Monitor returned, only to discover her opponent apparently giving up the fight, and convinced that the Virginia was quitting, and with orders only to protect the Minnesota and not risk his ship unnecessarily, Green did not pursue. Thus, both sides misinterpreted the moves of the other, and as a result, each claimed victory. Very, very strange. Uh, Confederate Secretary of the Navy Stephen Mallory wrote to President uh, Davis, uh, Confederate President Jefferson Davis of the action. The conduct of the officers and men of the squadron reflects unfading honor upon themselves and upon the Navy. The report will be read with deep interest and its details will not fail to rouse the ardor and nerves of uh, the arms of our gallant seamen. It will be remembered that the Virginia was a novelty in naval architecture wholly unlike any ship that ever floated, that her heaviest guns were equal novelties and ordnance, that her motive power and obedience to her helm were untried, her officers and crew strangers comparatively to the ship and to each other, and yet under all these disadvantages the dashing courage and consummate professional ability of Flag Officer Buchanan and his associates achieved the most remarkable victory which naval annals record." Uh, in Washington, the belief that the Monitor had vanquished the Virginia was so strong that Warden and his men were awarded the thanks of Congress. Uh, so, uh, clearly, there was a little bit of miscommunication happening here. Uh, during the two-day engagement, the USS Minnesota shot off 78 rounds of 10-inch solid shot, 67 rounds of 10-inch solid shot with 15-second fuse, 169 uh, rounds of 9-inch solid shot, 189-inch shells with a 15-second fuse, 35-8-inch shells with a 15-second fuse, and 5,500 pounds of service powder, gunpowder. Uh, three crew members were killed during the battle and 16 were wounded, uh, and uh, one of Monitor's crew was awarded the Medal of Honor. How about that? So, who won? Nobody uh, this was a very odd situation. So, the Virginia remained in dry dock for almost a month, getting repairs for the battle damage as well as minor modifications to improve her performance. On April 4th, she was able to leave dry dock. Uh, Buchanan, still recovering from his wound, had hoped that Catsby Jones would be picked to succeed him, uh, and most observers believed Jones's performance during the battle was outstanding. Uh, unfortunately, the seniority system for promotion in the Navy scuttled his chances, however, and the post went to 67-year-old Commodore Josiah Tatnell. Uh, Monitor, not severely damaged, remained on duty. 
Uh, and like his antagonist Jones, Green was deemed too young to remain as captain. The day after the battle, he was replaced with Tom, uh, uh, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. Uh, and uh, two days later, Selfridge was relieved by Lieutenant William Nicholson Jeffers. Uh, by late March, the Union blockade fleet had been augmented by refitted civilian ships. That included the SS Vanderbilt, the SS Arago, the SS Illinois, and the SS Erickson. How about that? Uh, these had been outfitted with rams and iron plating. By late April, uh, the new ironclads uh, E.A. Stevens and the USS Galena had also joined the blockade. And each side now had to consider how best to eliminate the threat posed by its opponent. And after Virginia returned, each side tried to goad the other into attacking under unfavorable circumstances. Both captains declined the opportunity to fight in water not of their own choosing. Jeffers, in particular, was under positive orders not to risk his ship. Uh, and consequently, each vessel spent the next month in what amounted to posturing. Not only did the two ships not fight each other, neither ship ever fought again. Uh, it, it was so strange. The, the uh, Eventually, both uh, both ships were lost here. The end came first for the Virginia. The, uh, the blockade was unbroken. Norfolk was of such little strategic use to the Confederacy, uh, and pre preliminary plans were laid up to move the ships up the James River to Richmond. Uh, before adequate preparations could be made, the Confederate Army under Major General Benjamin Huger abandoned the city on May 9th without consulting anybody from the Navy. Uh, Virginia's draft was too great to permit her to pass up the river, which had a depth of only 18 feet, uh, and then only under favorable circumstances. She was trapped, and she could only be captured or sunk by the Union Navy, and rather than allow either, Tattnall decided to destroy his own ship. He had her towed down to Craney Island in Portsmouth, where the gang were taken ashore, and she was set on fire. She burned for the rest of the day, most of the following night, uh, and shortly before dawn, before dawn, the flames reached her magazine and she blew up. Amazingly enough, Monitor likewise did not survive the year. She was ordered to Beaufort, North Carolina on Christmas Day to take part in the blockade over there. While she was being towed down the coast under command of her fourth captain now, uh, the wind increased and the waves grew high, and the monitor has no high sides, began taking on water. Soon the water in the hold gained on the pumps the, and uh, then put out the fires in the engines. The order was given to abandon ship, and most of the men were rescued by the USS Rhode Island, but 16 men went down with her when she sank in the early, early hours of December 31st, 1861. So who won? The victory claims that were made by both sides in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Hampton Roads, based as both were on the misinterpretations of their opponents' behavior, have been dismissed by present-day historians. They agree that the result of the Monitor Merrimack encounter was not a victory for either side, as the combat between the ironclads was the uh, primary significance of the battle. This general verdict is that the overall result is a draw. All would acknowledge that the Southern fleet inflicted more damage than it received, which would ordinarily imply that they gained a tactical victory. Uh, compared to other Civil War battles, the loss of men and ships for the Union Navy would be considered a clear defeat. But on the other hand, the blockade was not seriously threatened. So the entire battle can be regarded as an assault that ultimately failed. Uh, however, initially after the Battle of Hampton Roads, both the Confederates and the Unions used media to claim victory for their own sides. Uh, the headline, a Boston newspaper, the day after the battle read, The Merrimack Driven Back by the Steamer, implied a Union victory, while Confederate media focused, their uh, focused on the original success against the wooden uh, ships like the, uh, the Cumberland. Uh, despite the battle ending in a stalemate, it was seen by both sides as an opportunity to raise wartime morale, uh, especially since the ironclad ships were an exciting naval innovation that intrigued their citizens. Evaluation of the strategic results is likewise disputed. The blockade was maintained. It was even strengthened after a little while, and the Virginia was bottled up in Hampton Roads. Because a, a decisive Confederate uh, weapon was negated, some have concluded that the Union could claim a strategic victory. Confederate advocates can counter, however, uh, that Virginia had a military significance larger than the blockade, which was only a small part 
of the war in Tidewater, Virginia. Her mere presence was sufficient to close the James River to federal incursions. She also imposed other constraints on the Peninsula Campaign, being mounted by the Union Army under General George B. McClellan. We'll talk more about him later. Uh, who worried that she could interfere with his positions on the York River. And although his fears were completely baseless, uh, they continued to affect the movements of his army until Virginia was destroyed. Uh, so how about that? What impact did it have on naval warfare? Both days of the battle atta attracted attention from all the world's navies. The USS Monitor became the prototype for the Monitor warship type. She became the first of two ships whose names were applied to entire classes of their successors. The first was the Monitor. The second was the HMS Dreadnought. Many more were built, including river monitors, and they played key roles in Civil War battles, particularly on the Mississippi and James Rivers. The U.S. immediately started the construction of 10 more monitors based on Ericsson's original larger plan, which became known as the Passaic class. Uh, however, while the design proved exceptionally well suited for river combat, uh, the low profile and the heavy turret caused very poor seaworthiness in rough waters. Russia, fearing the American Civil War would spill into Russian Alaska, launched 10 sister ships as soon as Ericsson's plan reached St. Petersburg. Uh, what followed has been described as monitor mania. The revolving turret later inspired similar designs for future warships, which eventually became the modern battleship. The vulnerability of wooden hulls to armored ships was noted particularly in Britain and France, where the wisdom of the planned conversion of the battle fleet to armor was given a powerful demonstration. Another feature that was emulated was not so successful. Impressed by the ease with which the Virginia had sunk the Cumberland, the naval architects began to incorporate rams into their hull designs. Uh, the first purpose-built ram in the modern era was the French armored ram Tarao, in 1863, uh, whose guns were said to have had the sole function of preparing the way for the ram. The inclusion of rams in warship hull design persisted almost at the outbreak of World War I, despite improvements in naval gunnery that quickly made close action between warships almost suicidal, if not impossible. The Battle of Hampton Roads was a significant event in both naval and Civil War history. It's been detailed in many books, documentaries, film, TV shows, all sorts of things. In New York City, where the designer of the Monitor, John Erickson, died in 1889, a statue was commissioned by the state to commemorate the battle between the ironclads. The statue features a stylized male allegorical feature, I'm sorry, allegorical figure on water between two iron cleats, and it is located in McGolrick Park. Uh, in Virginia, the state dedicated the Monitor Merrimack Overlook at Anderson Park on a jetty that overlooks the site of the battle. The park contains several historical markers commemorating both ships, and in 1992, Virginia dedicated the $400 million, 4.6-mile-long uh, Monitor Merrimack Memorial Bridge Tunnel, which is located less than one mile from the site of the battle. Well, I think that's probably enough talking about the Monitor and the Virginia for now. It's, it's a topic that interests me greatly. Uh, it's, it's not often in history that one day changes the entire course of the future of a science. In this case, the day the Monitor and the Virginia had their fight, every navy in the world became obsolete. How often does that happen? For my own part, though, uh, as, mu as interesting as I find it, it really uh, the, the battle really didn't play that big of a role in the larger part of the war, uh, but it is still interesting to see the historical impact on such things. So, I'm going to throw in another couple of videos like this along the way. This History Channel game is 11 levels long, and these levels are mostly very, very short. A lot of these other Civil War games don't deserve an entire Let's Play, so I'm just going to throw these little intermissions in from time to time. So, this was intermission number one. Let me know if you like it. Let me know if I talked too much. And uh, I'll see you at the next level of the History Channel game. Goodbye. <laughs>